Our car tester Reinhold Deisenhofer says the VW Turan is popular with families, but the car maker makes lots of cars in the class, including the Golf Sports Van, the Golf Variant, the Caddy, and the Chiron. Then there's the Passat and the Passat Utility Wagon. Other manufacturers offer similar models, so Reinhold asks, why do people buy Turans? Because they're practical and flexible. The new Turan is even more flexible than its predecessor. That's due mostly to the fact that for this second edition of the car, VW has not only updated the design, but also made big technical improvements in its production. The Turan is based on a modular transverse matrix platform that allowed designers to add 11 centimeters to the wheelbase and makes the car 13 centimeters bigger overall. The five-seater model, for example, now has 1,980 liters of cargo space. Einhold points out that the tailgate is a lot easier to open, and you can fold down the seven seats to make even more room, turning a compact family van into a transport vehicle. This is not time-lapse photography. It really does happen that fast. You don't have to remove the seats to create all that storage space. Einhold recommends that buyers choose the fold-down passenger seat option. That will allow you to load items that are up to 2.7 meters long. As far as handling is concerned, when you're driving a Turan, you feel like you're in a Golf. Many of the basic components are the same. For example, the steering is just as precise and the gearbox just as responsive. And with its dynamic chassis control, you can choose from a variety of tuning options. The interior looks familiar, but VW's designers have added other features that they hope will increase sales. By the way, nearly two million Turans have been sold so far. Heinold says the car features the latest in connectivity. You can call up a number of apps like the Map app and skip the built-in navigation system. That'll save you a 350 euro extra. But you can't get a GPS signal when you're in a tunnel. The navigation system reads data from wheel sensors, he says, and they tell you how far you've gone. So the GPS can tell you to turn right even though there's no signal. An app can't do that. And there's another feature that's designed to help when you're trying to maneuver a trailer. Weinhold points out that pulling a trailer around is never easy, but trying to park a car and trailer is just about impossible unless you've got a lot of experience. The Turan features an option called Trailer Assist, and Reinhold's going to test it for us today. There's some acceleration and braking involved. The Trailer Assist reads the settings in the mirror and automatically makes sure the trailer is moving in the right direction. A camera monitors the tow bar but the driver still has to keep an eye on things. Weinhold says the trailer assist really does make parking much easier, although it takes some practice and coordination. Once you get used to the system, though, it works fine. The Turan is currently available with a power output of either 81 or 110 kilowatts. We tested the 110 kilowatt stick shift model. The engine came equipped with the Highline package of options. That brought the price of our five passenger vehicle in Germany to just under 33 and a half thousand euros. The six passenger model costs several hundred more. Reinhold says the new Turan is bigger and more practical than previous versions, and it's chock full of new features. In the trunk, for example, there is an electrical outlet, as well as a detachable flashlight with a magnetic strip. That makes searching at night easier. And there are over 40 storage options, although that could be a headache when you can't remember where you put something.
New technological developments are bringing the vision of accident-free transportation closer and closer, even in large commercial vehicles. Electronic assistance systems are constantly being improved and extended into new areas and new functions. On the grounds of Berlin's Schönefeld Airport, Mercedes demonstrates the current state of the technology for utility vehicles like buses and trucks. Wolfgang Bernhardt, the head of Daimler's trucks division, says that trucks turning corners in the city still cause serious accidents, especially with cyclists the drivers don't see in their blind spots. Daimler has now developed a sensor system that recognizes bike riders, warns the driver, and applies the brakes if the driver doesn't react. No one in the city would want to experience these driving maneuvers by an articulated bus. But new materials and technologies ensure that the driver maintains control even in extreme situations. This bus has a lightweight and yet extremely stable frame, as well as what is called ramp angle steering. The systems function in many ways like an electronic stability program. ESP systems have been a standard in Mercedes cars for 20 years. The carmaker first introduced them in 1995 in the S-Class. Within a few years, the control program was optimized for use in buses, transporters, and trucks. That wasn't easy considering the carmaker's wide range of vehicle variants and different axle configurations, superstructures, and loads. In the meantime, the lane departure warning system has also reached the road giants. Another example of the successful transfer of safety technology from passenger cars to utility vehicles is the emergency brake assist. In its newest form, Active Brake Assist 3, it doesn't merely minimize the consequences of a collision, it prevents a driver from rear-ending another car completely. Daimler is pushing research in the area especially hard when it comes to tour buses, where the lives of many people are at stake. And the new brake system works not only in buses, but also in heavy trucks. A crucial component of the technology is the adaptive cruise control, which uses radar to keep the vehicle in its lane, and is also able to recognize slow or stop vehicles on the road ahead. Serious highway accidents often involve trucks plowing into cars slowed in traffic jams. Now, experts expect the emergency brake assist to cut the rate of rear-end collisions by heavy trucks in half. The new assist stops the vehicle, says Bernhardt, though not yet for pedestrians or cyclists. That's next on the company's agenda. Mercedes has lots of new ideas to move forward in this area, and he expects a combination of advances to enable self-driving vehicles soon. That will be another step forward in truck safety, he says. In Germany, Mercedes recently received permission to test self-driving trucks on public roads. Vehicles like the Mercedes Future Truck 2025 bring together the latest results of assisted system development. The goal is not merely to make things easier for the driver, but also to increase safety for everyone on the road. Subaru has introduced its new mid-size station wagon, the Lavorg, closing the gap in its lineup between the Outback and the Impreza. At first, the only motor available in the model will be a 1.6-liter gasoline-powered DIT. It's the first time the Japanese carmaker has built a turbo direct injection engine with start-stop technology. There's now a coupe in Mercedes C-Class. With its crisp, clean design, the German carmaker is looking to boost its image for sporty models. The car's lightweight construction saves on weight compared to the other variants in the range, making the latest addition to the C-Class more agile. It will be available at dealerships by the end of 2015.
A man, a car, a stretch of racetrack. The Saquito Mallorca. But wait, you'll say, that's a station wagon. That's true, but this isn't just any station wagon. It's the most powerful one that Spain's automobile industry has to offer. The Seat Leon ST Cupra 280. A number of details distinguish the Cupra optically from the standard Leon. The front spoiler and radiator grille have a honeycomb look. The rear bears a roof edge spoiler and a checkered flag emblem. Under the hood, there's a four-cylinder, two-liter turbo engine. In our test car, it produces a maximum of 206 kilowatts of power and 350 newton meters of torque. A car tester Montes Curat says Seat has equipped the Leon Cupra with a limited slip differential on the front axle so that the car rarely understeers anymore. The power is applied as far as possible to the outside wheel. Montes says that makes it feel almost like a car with rear wheel drive. If it wasn't for an artificially limited top speed of 250 kilometers an hour, the Cupra could give a Porsche a run for its money. Seat says fuel consumption is a moderate 6.6 .6 liters, but only on country roads, not when pushing it flat out on a speedway. Matis is enthusiastic about what a button in this car with a checkered flag lets you do. Change all the car's driving characteristics, from comfortable through sporty to true Cupra. He's impressed with how the shock absorbers firm up and the steering tightens for an exhilarating drive. The Cupra is therefore suited for everything from everyday in-town shopping and child chauffeuring to sporty driving on a racetrack, he says. The Cupra comes with either a manual or automatic double-clutch transmission with six gears either way. Manual shifting is more fun, but on this racetrack, which has five left curves and eight right, it demands more concentration from the driver. The seats are comfortable with decent lateral support. If you want more, Seat also offers bucket seats. The dashboard is laid out well, and the speedometer is marked up to 300 kilometers an hour despite the electronic cap. The most powerful Cupra starts at just under 35,000 euros in Germany. For comparison, a Golf R variant will set you back well over 40,000 euros. Of course, the range of options tempts you to spend more. For example, for the performance package, which includes bigger brakes, a leather interior, and a wide selection of safety features. The Leon Cupra costs a bit more than a Leon with the smallest engine on offer, but in comparison with other cars that pack similar amounts of power, says Matis, it's priced very competitively. He thinks it's a good choice for people who occasionally like a brisk ride. BMW's first X1 was a smash hit that left the competition looking antiquated. It wasn't even very pretty because it was based on the Touring 3 Series platform, which couldn't be altered enough before the launch. But BMW wanted the X1 out on the market fast to steal a march on competitors. And the plan worked. Practically overnight, the vehicle became a bestseller. Now the Bavarian car maker has introduced the second generation X1. Based on the 2 Series Grand Tour platform, it's wider, more seasoned, and more sophisticated. Product manager Stefan Müller says that was the goal, to make the new X1 look more grown up. It's actually a little shorter than its predecessor, but noticeably higher and wider. BMW wanted to make the exterior design proportions brawnier and to be more generous in terms of interior options. The new X1's headlight design is similar to its big brothers, while its front end sports the carmaker's trademark kidney-shaped grille. 
The smallest X in the stable now looks more burly and powerful. Project head Rolf Grazer says that in terms of proportions, this car is more X-like than the last one. It has a shorter hood, a really beautiful greenhouse, and great roof dynamics. He thinks it really makes a very sporty, very masculine impression. Although the car has grown a tiny bit shorter, the five centimeters of extra height make it more impressive, and that extra height has really paid off inside. Grazer says the interior's been expanded, and that customers will notice. It now gives rear seat passengers a lot more leg room, and the amount of space in the trunk has also grown significantly. It can now carry up to 1,550 liters of cargo. And for a little extra, you can buy a shotgun seat with a backrest that lowers completely, giving you almost as much space as a moving van. But hold on, a moving van? Practicality? Are we still talking about a Beamer? Yes, we are. Get behind the wheel and you'll find that BMW's focus on a great driving experience hasn't changed a bit. Razor says the X1 comes now with a new twin power turbo motor in three and four cylinder versions. And the X-Drive system has also been adapted and redeveloped specifically for the X1. The four-wheel drive is now more economical. Under normal road conditions, the X1 stays in front-wheel drive, but if any slippage occurs or if the driver activates sport mode, the rear axle drive also kicks in. Driving Dynamics Chief Albert Meyer gives us a demonstration of some of the new X1's off-roading capabilities. First, by taking us over a couple of steep, laterally tilted surfaces up to 34 degrees. The X1 masters them with no problem, says Meyer. But of course, when you're off-roading, you have to drive slowly and carefully and keep an eye on the surface. Next, he takes us directly up a 26-degree slope to show us how well it's able to climb. On the other side, the car has to descend again, of course, so he hits the HDC function, which turns on a chosen pre-programmed speed. The car then drives down the steep slope all on its own. It brakes all on its own. Meyer isn't doing anything. The car's regulating mechanism does everything you need to off-road all on its own, turning the wheels at the optimum speed, stabilizing the car overall, and braking cleanly the whole way down the slope. The version we tested, the X-Drive 25D, comes with a redesigned two-liter motor its four cylinders generate 170 kilowatts of power. The eight gear Steptronic transmission hurls it to 100 kilometers an hour in just over six and a half seconds. And the model's top speed is 235 kilometers an hour. It burns five liters of fuel per 100 kilometers on the road, making its theoretical CO2 footprint a modest 132 grams per kilometer. With its impressive abilities, the X1 promises to carry on the successful tradition begun by its forebear. But its price is impressive as well. In Germany, the basic X125D package starts at 42,500 euros. Open the throttle. Our test rider Christoph Bauer is negotiating the mountain passes in northern Italy's Trentino region. He's riding a vintage 1930 DKW Super Sport 600. Christoph says that DKW has a long tradition of making quality motorcycles. In 1919, they built the first auxiliary motor for a two-wheeled vehicle. Some referred to it as a butt warmer. Over the next decade, DKW grew into one of the world's largest manufacturers of motorcycles. And this super sport is the firm's crowning achievement. It's designed for long hauls at top speeds.
The engine makes a distinctive chatter. It's actually a two-stroke motor. With 600 cc's of displacement, this is the biggest and baddest cycle the DKW ever built. Christoph says that at the beginning of the 1930s, the DKW Super Sport was the fastest bike around, 22 horsepower and a top speed of 100 kilometers per hour with a sidecar. But the sidecar could take some getting used to. If you went into a fast curve on the left, it could lift off. So you had to keep calm and not try to steer too hard against it. Otherwise, you'd end up in the opposite lane. And if you went too fast into a curve on the right, the cycle itself could flip over the nose of the sidecar. Christoph says that there was nothing like the DKW Super Sport on the road at that time. Motorbikes are lighter and more refined. Everything from the chrome radiator to the two mufflers is solid. It weighs 170 kilos all on its own, but since it's so powerful and rugged, it's perfect for use with a sidecar. So 170 kilos by itself and 240 with the sidecar. <laughs> wow. Whoa. Two-stroke engines, like the one in the Super Sport 600, tend to overheat. That's where the bike's radiator comes in. The chrome-plated streamlined gas tank holds 14 liters. That's enough to travel about 200 kilometers, even at high speeds. The sturdy tubular steel frame is perfectly suited for use with a sidecar. Advertisements from that period describe the 600 as the greatest motorcycle of its kind. The 600's three-speed clutch and fish fin exhaust system were pretty modern for the time. The bike could hit a top speed of 130 kilometers per hour without the sidecar. Christoph says that the DKW's two-stroke engine had a lot of power for a 1930s motorcycle, 22 horsepower. That doesn't sound like much today, but that 600cc displacement, water-cooled engine, and flat piston crowns were top-of-the-line features back then. DKW also used some of this technology in the top-selling small car of that period, the F1. It was the first German car with front-wheel drive. There was even a DKW aircraft. Flugzeug wurde mit dieser Turbine betrieben. Hut ab. In German, DKW stands for Steam Powered Vehicle. The company started out building accessories for steam engines. But by 1930, DKW was building 60,000 motorcycles a year. Christoph points out that this model is the rarest DKW bike of all. Only 300 of them were built. In 1930, Germany was in the middle of the Great Depression, and few people could afford luxuries like motorcycles. A Super Sport 600 cost about the same as a small car, like the Opel P4. Production of the 600 was canceled in 1933, after just three years. Christoph says it's a real shame. In 1934, DKW motorcycles started using reverse scavenging exhaust technology in all their engines. This allowed better engine performance and improved fuel efficiency. Christoph says the DKW Super Sport 600 is a bike for real men. Big, powerful, and built like a tank. If you took a machine like this on the road in the early 1930s, you were in for a real adventure. And the 600's engine served as the model for the one used in the first German passenger car with front wheel drive, the DKW F1. Up until the 1950s, they hardly changed the design of that car. So you can say that the DKW Super Sport 600 was definitely a milestone in German automotive history. Fans of the Super Sport 600 refer to it today with great reverence as the Cadillac of motorcycles and perhaps the most exciting DKW vehicle ever built.